John? Yes. Who's calling me? Um, uh, we, uh, we. Who is that? Monica. Yeah. Yes, how can I help you? I out or I'm still in? Because I don't see anything. I'm in. You are in and father is sharing the first slide. I can't hear anything. Monica, if we can hear you talk, that means you are in. Ah. Yes, right. The second dot to your left, you know, you touch the second dot to your left. Your connection is poor. You're breaking up. That could be the reason why you cannot see the screen. Okay, I'll try again then. All right, everyone, it's 8.05, and so we will start our class. Uh, John, can you just lock the room, and, um, and we will begin for the rest. Um, you can follow us on Facebook page, right? If you know of anyone else who is coming in and will send you a message, just let them know to, to go to the Facebook page, okay? name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, 
We have come to the last of our four talks in this series on the last things. Uh, so there's a ring of irony to it. The last talk of the last things, right? Um, and I hope this would not be the last time that you hear about the first, but about the last things. Uh, as I said, it is a long established Catholic tradition to encourage us to meditate on the last things, death, judgment, heaven and hell, uh, in order to prepare us for what is to come. Um, and our response to that is not so much in terms of fear. The, the meditation and the contemplation of the last things is definitely not intended to instill fear in us, instill panic in us, but rather to help us have a correct orientation in life. Because when we realize that this is the end, this is our objective, this is our destination, then everything we do in this life matters. And whatever decision that we should be taking should lead us to this particular uh, direction, to this destination, all right? Or rather, if you want to get to heaven, then every action and decision of yours should be orientated towards heaven. Of course, the opposite would be true. If you ignore that, and every action of yours ignores the commandments of God, turns away from God, then basically your decision and your actions will ultimately lead to eternal separation from God. We will receive what we aspire for. And how do we know that we aspire for these things? No, I, I'm not saying that anyone wishes to be in hell, right? No one consciously thinks about that. But, well, we reap what we sow. And so if, if our demeanor, if our disposition in life, and in, the, in terms of our lifestyle and the actions and decisions which we make in this life is one which is contrary to the will of God, we are sending out a clear message to God. All right? Uh, in a way, our actions do not lie. We may lie with our words. We may even convince ourselves. We may lie to ourselves uh, in terms of our reasoning. But our actions do not lie. And our actions will ultimately bear consequences. Okay? So uh, just a quick recap of the last four days. And uh, we started the first day with an introduction to this whole theme of eschatology about the end times. And I explained that the end times has to do with the second coming of Christ. All right. So very often that is ignored when we are talking about the end times. We talk about the end times, we are more focused on all the signs. And what are these signs? The cataclysmic signs, a pandemic, an earthquake, world war, uh, e economic meltdown, um, destruction, meteor plunging towards earth, uh, bringing about maybe another new ice age, destroying all life here. So we think of all these things in terms of the end of the world. And we fail to recognize that actually the end of the world is connected to Christ's second coming. And so, you know, you may have heard of this saying, we are an Easter people and Alleluia is our song. And I would like to say that it is also accurate to say we are an Advent people and Maranatha is our song. We are a people preparing for the second coming of Christ in fact, our song is Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We should desire, we should pray for this, we should look forward to it. And if you don't believe me, don't, take, don't just take my word for it. The prayer that we had just prayed a while ago, the Our Father, which our Lord himself taught us, is a prayer that looks forward to Christ's coming. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Without realizing it, every time we pray this prayer, and and I guess for many of you, it is a prayer that is prayed daily. And, and if you've been used to praying the rosary every day, you will pray it repeatedly every day. And this is what we are praying for. We are praying for the end of the world. We are praying for the second coming of Christ. And when we, when we identify the end of the world, the second coming of Christ, well, our whole perspective changes. The whole context changes. When we focus just on those cataclysmic signs of destruction, then certainly it's something which is frightening, all right? But as I always say, this can be quite distracting. Eh? 
um, sometimes in Protestant eschatology, especially those who like to make correlations between the predictions in the Bible and current events in the world, the focus is always on these kind of signs, right? All these destructive signs. And the tendency is that we are also drawn to it. There is also the apparitions of Our Lady, the messages of Our Lady. Also, we are drawn to all those horrible images. And I'm not saying that we should just discount all these things. They are there. But we are reminded by our Lord that these are not signs of the end. The end will be connected with his second coming when he comes in glory. All right? So we take the end time seriously. Even perhaps we can say, in all honesty, that we take it more seriously than the Protestants. Because our focus is on Christ. For us, the end times should be a happy occasion. An occasion for rejoicing. Especially if we have been anticipating it, preparing for it looking for it, living our lives in anticipation of his coming, then indeed it is an occasion of great rejoicing. All right? And so we should take it seriously. When is this going to happen? Well, in Jesus' own words, we will not know the time. And, and the fact that we, have, we do not have this knowledge and we should not speculate on this, on, on this particular aspect of the, the second coming is because we should be trusting in God's providence, his authority, his sovereignty. When you do not know exactly what's going to happen in the future, you will then learn how to place your trust in God. And this is what we must do. Place our trust in God, rather than to try to manipulate our future. And people do that. You know, when you're panicking and doing very often, the first thing you you will try to do is to try to control your future. You will attempt to change that future. If you hear of it, you will attempt to change the future. You will try to control your future. And the fact of the matter is, it's futile, right? We can't control the future. We can't control what's going to happen. But we know someone can control the future. It is God. And so when we do not know the exact time, it is basically placing ourselves in the hands of God. Trusting in his providence. When will this happen? At least we know it is not all these destructive signs which will point to the end of the world. And so we are living in the midst of a pandemic. A pandemic we have never seen before. Of course, there have been horrible plagues in the past and things like that. And it's always difficult to make a comparison because every person will always say, my time is the worst time, you know. When World War I took place, they call it the Great War. They call it Great War. And some would say it's the Great War to end all other wars. There will be, there hasn't been, there will be nothing compared to this. And then World War II came and was way bigger in terms of scale. And so every generation always will cry foul and say, you know, this is the worst time in history. All right. You will hear all this. The doomsday pundits will say, you know, it's the worst time. This is definitely the end. There has been, this has been said countless times over the centuries. Every time when something bad happens, oh, this is it. This is it. Nothing compares to this. And so Jesus invites us to focus on what really need, uh, what is the true sign of his coming. When will it happen? Well, he tells us, that his coming is suspended, or St. Paul tells us that the coming is suspended. And, it, and this is interesting because it comes with a commission. It comes with a mission given to us. For Christ to come again, our job now is to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Why is this connected to the end of the world? Because when Christ comes again, he comes in judgment of the living and the dead. And everyone needs to be prepared for that. So in a way, you can look at evangelization as not adding up to our numbers, making the church bigger. That's, that's true. It's not just merely spreading the gospel. That's true. But why is the reason that we need to spread the gospel, preach the gospel? That's because we're getting people ready for the final judgment. It would not be fair that they face judgment in ignorance. They should face judgment knowing the truth. 
So before Christ's coming, will there be, will the church undergo difficulties? Yes, persecution from outside, turmoil from within, and we are seeing that, and it's not just this particular century. We have been seeing that every century, the church has always been tested again and again. And yet this is our hope. Our hope is not just false optimism that one day things will be better. Our, our hope is not that one day the church will no longer be persecuted. Our hope is not that one day we will have perfect leaders, saintly leaders, that we will have priests that we will not be upset with, get, get angry with, bishops or even popes, that we will have a perfect set of leaders. All right? All this is quite delusional now. Right? There we have good leaders. We have saintly leaders. But also, throughout the church's history, we've had terrible leaders. We have, you know, terrible members. And that's going to be true. But Christian hope is this, that Christ will be victorious. Death and evil will not have the final word. So what should our response be? Rather than fret and worry about so many things, and panic and, and, and try to, to predict the day. And uh, we should be watchful and vigilant. And I say this, this is a tagline, this is a catchphrase to explain living according obediently to the commandments of Christ. It is to undergo a daily ongoing conversion. So we become more like Christ every day. All right. That requires a turning away from sin. That's called repentance. And a turning towards Christ, which is faith. Therefore, you will see this beautifully summarized in the first words of Jesus as he proclaims the, uh, as he enters into public ministry in the synoptic gospels. Repent and believe in the good news. So, we start on Monday, Tuesday. We start Sunday with the introduction, talking about the parousia, the second coming of Christ. Monday and yesterday, we talked about death, judgment, and hell. These are called the eschata, all right? So we've covered that. I will just give a, a, a brief summary of what I've spoken of in the last two days. To get a more detailed presentation, I hope that you will have the chance. If this is the first time you're watching the video or this is the second time and you've only watched one or two in the series uh, actually this is the fourth talk okay so you can go back to this facebook page and those of you on in zoom and you've missed the earlier sessions go back to jesus caritas catholic church facebook page and you will find the previous videos i would like to encourage you to watch the previous videos to get a bigger picture and a better picture of this whole topic so what did i Share about death, right? I say, first of all, the first thing is that death makes us wiser. It makes us understand that we should not waste away our seconds, our hours, our days, and our years, our months, and our years. That every moment is decisive. Every moment is urgent. Every moment calls us to take it seriously. Death renders life decisive. Why? Because there's no second chance of the death. Some people say, okay, in this life, you know, even if we fail, never mind, we'll come back again. You know, in, in, in certain religions, they will say, you come back again in terms of karma, you come back as a lesser life, uh, uh, you know, a lower life form, all right? You won't even get the privilege of that because it ends with death and we can't change our ultimate and fundamental decisions in life. And because we can no longer change things in life, we better make correct decisions today. You know, there's this Chinese expression which I came up with when I used to minister to, to the Chinese community in my first parish in one of the rural areas. Um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, you have families and individuals who, have, who are lapsed in terms of their faith. They were baptized Catholics, raised as Catholics, and eventually left the church, all right? There would be an opportunity, even on your deathbed, if you have lived the last few years of life in depravity, in sin, there will still be that last opportunity for con conversion. And sometimes some people 
just do not see a need for that. And so die in, in that particular state, all right? And then after their death, then everyone gets all worked up, okay? We want a, a, a full funeral. We want body to be brought into church. And, and the word goes out is, you know, when a person was alive, he actually said, you know, even if I'm dead, don't bring my body to the church. But after they are dead, the family members want to bring the body to the church. It's as if, like, if you bring the body to the church, then everything is okay, all right? So I came up with this expression. I'm not sure whether you understand Mandarin, but it's like this. When you're alive, you don't want to enter the church. When you're dead, don't force your way. All right? It reflects somewhat that first statement. Death renders life decisive. If in life you chose not to enter the church, if in life you chose not to believe in God or follow his commandments, if in life you chose to live a life separated from God, after death, there is no opportunity to change that decision. So if you want to change the decision, better do it now. So learning how to die well means learning how to live well. And I also said that, you know, it's important to have a theological understanding of death. Today, it seems doctors and so-called signs, you know, every time science is quoted, but you, you realize that over the century, science, the definitions of science has changed. It's certainly malleable. And I would say even political. Science is not just facts, but the interpretation we bring to the facts. And because it's interpretation that we bring to the facts, there is a political element to it. In other words, I have a particular agenda and therefore these facts must match that agenda. And so I provide an interpretation to understand those facts, okay? So abortion is one of those things, all right? It would seem that you can recognize a single cell as life. That's why they are sending probes over, you know, to other planets, to the planet Mars, trying to look for life. And I'm quite sure they're not looking for a green colored alien, all right? <laughs> they're looking for, if they could only find a single cell, life form, they would have said, we discovered life on Mars. And yet, when life is formed in a mother's womb, they would say it's not life. It's not a sentient being, so we don't recognize it. You can recognize life if you were to find it in a different planet, even if it was not sentient, even if it was just something that, that, that could move and things like that. Right, but in the womb, it's not life. So we have so-called medical experts and science giving different definitions and arguing over it. But for us Christians, very simple. The definition of death is connected to our creation, to our existence. We are created, uniquely created in the whole universe with a spiritual soul. We can speak in a broad sense about the soul of other living beings, the anima, the life force. But no other being, living being, has a spiritual soul. Only humans have that spiritual soul. And it is in that spiritual soul that we can describe ourselves as made in the image likeness of God. Because the intellect and the will uh, derives itself from that very spiritual soul. So at death, the soul and the body, which are so integrated, and yet that integration, that relationship has already been marred by sin, by original sin and by our sins, now separates. That's why we say the wages of sin is death. Because it is sin that brings about that separation. That, that, that integration between our bodies and our souls were not meant to separate. We were not meant to die. That's called perfect harmony. But sin destroyed perfect harmony. Or rather, sin injured perfect harmony. Did not destroy it entirely. That's why we did not die immediately from that moment. Adam didn't just fall down and die. He began to age, he began to suffer, and just like all of us, we experience suffering and aging and all kinds of troubles in our lives, and finally we come to the moment where we will die, that final separation of the soul from the body. But this is the good news. You know, 
the Christian vision of things usually comes in, we have to consider it in three parts. Uh, the Catholic vision of the world, the worldview. Uh, we are not, how would you say, fully optimistic as to say that there's no problem in this world. Neither are we so pessimistic to say that everything is evil in this world. The Catholic worldview, first of all, recognizes this. God created everything good, perfect harmony. That was the original plan of God, to be with him right at the start already, to be with him in paradise forever. So that's a beautiful, optimistic view. But then we recognize the fall came because of man's sin. That original harmony has been disrupted. So you just focus just on the sin, that everything is pessimistic, everything is negative, right? But Catholics don't just focus on that. We recognize the first that God created everything good, but we don't stop there because if you say create everything good, then we just say, oh, everything is good. You know, this is good, that is good. If you leave your wife, you sleep with somebody else, you have an affair, that's also good. It's okay, everything is good. That's ridiculous. Neither can we say everything is evil, everything is sinful. That's never the Catholic view. And then the last part of it is this. Christ came to save us. If everything was hunky-dory and perfect, then there is no need for a savior. And if there is no savior and things are not hunky-dory, then there, we are condemned. We are damned right from the start. What's the point of trying to be good in the first place? So our Catholic worldview is so important. We recognize the original harmony. God wanted, created everything good in harmony. And then sin came in and disrupted that harmony. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is now he has sent his son to be our redeemer and our savior. And so Christ took what was a curse. Death is the curse of sin. He took the curse and he transformed it into a blessing. Now, death is no longer a dead end. Death is a doorway to heaven. See? At that very moment when the devil thought that he had won his greatest victory, he won his victory with man by causing him to sin. And therefore, as a result of that, now man has to suffer and he has to suffer death, the final enemy. And then the devil thought he could win this victory over the Son of God by killing him. He thought it was his great victory on the cross. But he was proven wrong. It was Christ's victory. Christ defeated the devil on the cross. Christ defeated death by his own death. And so transform death. What would be the instrument of execution and death would not now be the instrument of life. That's why we call the fathers of the church describe the cross as the new tree of life. You know, in the Garden of Eden, there were two important trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which the devil tempted Adam and Eve to eat. And as a result of that, they, they fell. And then there was the other tree, the tree of life. It was a symbol of man's original immortality. He wasn't meant to die. And so now the fathers of the church describe the cross as the tree of life. Now imagine that. Jesus' death brings life to us. All right? Having seen that, that death is not something to be feared, but something we should look forward to. Why? Because now it has been changed into a blessing. It is the doorway to eternal life. Death brings an end to this life, this temporary life. But death also marks the beginning of a new life, eternal life. And because of that, we need to prepare for a happy death. And how do we do that? Well, we have to start making regular confession, uh, making perhaps on a daily basis, examining our conscience, honing our conscience so that we will know what is good and what is bad, recognize the ways of the devil in order that we may rely on the grace of God, all right, for our salvation. Grow in, in daily conversion and repentance. That's how we prepare for a happy death. And then I talked about judgment. 
judgment takes place at the moment of death. And there are actually two phases to that judgment, or sometimes they describe two types of judgment. But let's look at judgment as one, as this continuum, and there's one phase which take place immediately upon your death. And then the second half of that judgment will take place at the end of time when Christ comes again to judge the living and the dead. And so I explained that that judgment that takes place at death is called particular judgment. And here you will really get the sentence, whether you're destined for heaven immediately, that means you die in a state of grace without original sin and also free from, from venial sin, the effects of venial sin, that you're destined immediately for heaven. You're a saint already the moment you are dead because you were a saint before you died. Or, like us lesser folks, <laughs> most of us want to be saints, but we fail. We have our limitations. We still need to go through some purification. Then there's purgatory. Yeah, I'm going to talk about purgatory today. Or, you were unrepentant. In life, you chose through your decision and to your lifestyle and your behavior to separate yourself from God and others. And so at death, our, we get our wish, all right? Our wish would be fulfilled upon death, whether we had lived a life for heaven or we, whether we have lived a life for hell. What's that criteria for judgment? Christ will be the criteria for judgment. Christ will be the standard for judgment. So it's important for us to look at it from the angle of our faith in him, to believe in him, to obey his commandments and to avoid mortal sin. How do we anticipate the judgment? We should. It's like preparing for a happy death. Well, we should go for regular confession, examination of conscience, grow in obedience and fidelity, also undergo ongoing conversion. It is like preparing for the happy death. So it's an anticipation of judgment. Then what about this last judgment? The last judgment will take place at Christ's second coming. Now, is this a court of appeal? Is this a second chance given to us? No. Judgment has already been delivered. Sentence has been given at the moment of death. The last judgment actually allows us to see the, the fuller ramifications of our actions. When you die, the particular judgment, you will see your actions. Your actions will be presented before you and why you will be going to heaven or why you'll be going to hell. You will know the charge. And, and there's no way of arguing out of it, getting yourself out of it. But at the final judgment, we will see the effects of our actions and decisions, the impact on our on our, of our actions on other people and also the, uh, the effect and impact on, of their lives on us. All things will be made clear. We will have to, to face the mirror of truth and confront our truth and the truth of others. So people may be thinking of this in a negative sense. Oh, I don't want all my dirty laundry to be drawn out. You know, I just want to cover it. And that's the reason for, for purgatory. Purgatory is actually to get rid of this. Get rid of the fact that we need we would be ashamed of our sins. And having passed through purgatory, we will no longer be ashamed because those sins have no hold over us. No longer. No longer any hold over us. So even if someone would say those things in front of us, it's kind of like, ha, I can look back and say, yeah, yeah, I made all those silly mis mistakes. But by the grace and mercy of God, I have been saved. All right, But for those who cannot let go of these things, those who eventually through their decisions and their lives end up in hell, well, it will be the greatest pain of humiliation and not just humiliation, of judgment. That judgment will hang over them. Not because God is using this against them, but God is just merely helping them to see this. So I would like to say that, you know, for the righteous also, we also begin to see the goodness of other people. Maybe you've never noticed it. Maybe you have not even known about this, about the things people have done for you after you have died, 
the number of people who made sacrifices for you, the number of people who prayed for you, all those will be made known at the final judgment. Okay, so yesterday we talked about this quite juicy topic of hell. And most people would think hell is a myth. It doesn't exist. Created by the church just to, to scare the wits out of us and to force us into compliance. Well, that's not true. It's quite logical to speak of hell because it is connected to human freedom. Hell is possible because God's offer of grace, God's offer of saving us, of giving us life with him, is an offer. It is a gift. It cannot compel us. He cannot force us to accept that grace. Because we have freedom. And because we have freedom, hell is a real possibility. Because we can always reject a gift. If we have no freedom to reject that gift, then okay, then hell will not exist. Likewise, heaven would also not exist because, all right, we will not be free beings, you know. We will just be like zombies, you know. You know, you've seen some of these movies where you where you lonely people create these robots to love them. Quite sad stories. Eh? And in a way, it is a reflection of a dystopian world that, you know, in order for someone to love you, you have to force the person to love you. And you know that's not love. It's a lie. So for God, who is love, created us out of love and gave us this vocation to love, he's not going to force us to love him. We must do it willingly. And we can also freely reject that love. And I spoke about how hell is a mystery. It's a mystery in two, in two aspects. First of all, in man that why would we even choose something which is bad and detrimental to us in our future? That's a mystery. And also, the God of truth, the God of justice, can also be at the same time the God of mercy. You know, truth and justice are connected. Now. Some people say today we live in a post-truth era. And what does that mean? It means truth is often said to be relative, Malleable, that means you can change it, you can shape it. Uh, we see it in so-called the, the media, politicians. They take what they call facts and you can piece facts together and present something. So much so that there will be two sets of person with the same facts presenting different conclusions. This is the post-truth world. And because of that, sometimes we are confused and we often think, well... If they can do that, then we also can do that, right? And we come to recognize that in a world where there is no truth, no absolute truth, it's also a world that there can be no justice, right? Every court case must be the findings, the conclusion of that trial must be based on truth, not just on opinion and feelings. When it's based on opinions and feelings, we we will say it's a miscarriage of justice. So the goal of every trial is to get at the truth. All right. But yet, you know, sometimes the truth can be very painful. And so that's for we subscribe to the so-called post-truth era propaganda. We don't like the truth. We like to reshape the truth. We choose the truth that agrees with us. It's called an echo chamber. You know, I, I often tell people, I said, you know, it, sometimes if you like the way I speak, maybe it's because I'm your echo chamber. Because I, I'm just saying things that you agree with. If what I say disturbs you, it may be, you know, I'm not echoing what you feel. That's why sometimes when, when answers are given, you ask a question and the answer is given. You're not happy with it. Because what are you looking for? Sometimes it's not looking for the truth. You're looking for confirmation. Isn't it? This world is always looking for confirmation. I want to be confirmed. <laughs> I don't want, you know, tell me the truth. As long as you agree with me, 
Because if you don't agree with me, you know, then you're talking rots. Okay. So did God create hell? No. Hell is the result of our mortal sins. And so we speak of the punishment of hell. We talk about eternal separation as the ultimate punishment. We often think fire is the, is the worst thing that can happen in hell. No, the worst thing about hell is the eternal separation, the eternal isolation of the soul, cut off from God and from others. We already get a glimpse of this in this life. When we struggle with loneliness, when we struggle with broken relationships, when we struggle with unforgiveness, we see how painful it is on us, not just on other people, on us. And so imagine that for eternity and a state of eternal separation. So the church is not saying fire is the worst thing about hell. No. Well, fire is spoken of, whether metaphorically, Jesus seems to refer to it, and I gave some examples about uh, in, in scripture, referring to Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom, the rubbish heap, where the, the, the rubbish was being burnt. Uh, and so, in a way, it is an analogy for, for these people in hell. They're like rubbish cast aside. Okay? Uh, okay. And then I gave a summary of purgatory. And I, I said purgatory is definitely not... Uh, Hell light, L I T E, you know, like today you've got Coke light and all those things, uh, less sugar, everything. So, lots of people think purgatory is hell light, less painful than hell, uh, uh. but it isn't. Purgatory is not hell with a parole, meaning you've been condemned, but you've been let loose on good behavior. No, that's not it. The next thing is that lots of people will say purgatory is invented by the church. Where do you find it in the Bible? And in yesterday's session, so if you have not watched yesterday's session, you should go. I've highlighted a few scriptural passages, though the word purgatory is not used. Uh, the word purification is used, all right, by St. Paul. But there are several texts in which affirms, provides the foundation for the Catholic doctrine on purgatory. Also, purgatory the metaphysical foundation of purgatory is that it is able to reconcile two aspects of God, his mercy and his justice. God's mercy is wanting to save all of us. And God's justice is we must be accountable for our actions. We must face up to the truth. So when you try to bring these two things together, sometimes it doesn't seem to match, right? Right? In this world, we often say, you know, when you show mercy, then you must tell a lie. Lie and then you show mercy. No. How can that be? Lying is not merciful. Recently, the son or the stepson of a particular important politician had been exonerated. His charges has been dropped. And I wouldn't say the whole country, um, quite a number of people in this country are crying foul. Okay, where is the justice of this? Some people are saying, wow, it's mercy. Is it? it is mercy, isn't it? It's mercy to him. But does he deserve that mercy? Notice, notice how we look at it. So we think that justice is not served by telling a lie, by pretending it didn't happen. So he has to pay for it. So here, purgatory speaks of that. Purgatory is where God permits us to be accountable for our actions. And yet, it also reflects his intention of saving us. And I gave the example of how a father would punish his child, not because the father is mean and hateful. No, because the father wants the best for the child. The father wants the child to learn. The father wants what is the child to grow from this experience. And so that punishment is not seen as something which is destructive, but rehabilitative. Now, St. Catherine of Genoa says, you know, the souls in purgatory are happier than people here. Why? Because over here, we can never be too presumptuous and say our salvation is secure. We, we can't claim to do that, all right? But the souls in purgatory can say that with certainty. They know they will be saved. 
All right. So this, the souls in purgatory are in preparation to enter into that last stage, which is heaven. I'm going to speak about that today. And finally, what is our duty to, for the, of Christians? The church calls us to pray for the dead. Yesterday, there was a question asked, but actually I answered that question the day before, or even on Sunday. It's about to the souls in purgatory, can they pray for us? And I said that there are theologians who have taught that the souls in purgatory can pray for us. It is not defined dogma, neither is it rejected. So there are theologians who say um, that the souls in purgatory can pray for us, but the souls in purgatory cannot pray for themselves. So we only we can pray for each other. We can pray for ourselves and we can pray for the souls in purgatory. The saints of heaven don't need our prayer. So the saints in heaven intercede for the souls in purgatory. The saints of heaven intercede for us. Okay. So let's get to the topic for today. Life's ultimate purpose, divine beatitude and heaven. Do you know where you're going to? Okay, it sounds like a song, right? And the answer to that question ultimately is this. We are destined for heaven. We are created for heaven. In the old Penny Catechism or the old Baltimore Catechism, if you're from the U.S., the question is, um, in a penny one, is the second question. Why did God make you? And the answer is simple. God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in heaven. So in this life, we have three particular things or vocation. It is to know God. And by knowing God, we increase, our love for him increases. And when we love him, we are willing to serve him, to obey him. But all of this is in preparation for the reward that we will receive after our death, to be happy with him forever in heaven. So what is life's ultimate purpose? You know, religions, many religions come about because they attempt to answer some of life's great questions. And perhaps the most important question of all is man's destiny, his purpose, the reason for his existence, and what's going to happen at the end of his life. What is his goal in life? So all major religions speak about this, all right? They, they provide different answers, however. And, and notice that the ending in their story will also shape the teachings with regards to life. How we live our lives will, will determine whether we arrive at our goals. So this is common, universal in all religions. But there is something unique about Christianity, and St. Thomas Aquinas argues this. He says that Christianity is distinctively reasonable among all religions. Now, I'm quite sure that many of your friends and some of your family members who are from other religions will disagree with this. And he says, oh, our religion is also quite reasonable, and that's why if it wasn't reasonable, then, you know, we wouldn't be who we are. But why would St. Thomas say something like that, that Christianity is distinctively reasonable? Well, he says, Christianity does not propose that human existence ends at death or that a human soul reincarnates until it is freed from the cycle of rebirth so as to live in a permanently impersonal state. Now, St. Thomas is actually referring to two different streams, okay? The first one is a materialistic perception of, of the world, of life, of existence. That life, our existence, is confined to this human life. From the moment I'm born to the moment that I die. 
That's it. There's nothing beyond this. So it's a very materialistic uh, conception of life itself. And then you have another option. And the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about reincarnation, we think about the, the, the South Indian religions, isn't it? Um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, with, although there are quite uh, substantial differences between them. But basically, in general, they speak of some kind of reincarnation, transmigration of the souls for the Hindus. Some will say it is not so. Um, but basically, uh, a reality which is cyclic. It means your life is not just confined to this life. There are other lives before and after. And the only way in which you can find some form of liberation is reaching Nirvana. Now, it's interesting because not only the, the, the South Indian religions teach this and proclaim this, you will also find this among the Greeks. You will also find this among, among the Celts, the Celtic people, all right? The belief. So the idea of Christianity that our lives here and then there is a life after is in fact quite unique because in many different cultures, Asian cultures, ancient cultures, sorry, not Asian, ancient cultures, whether it be the Celtic people of the British Isles of France, Spain, or the, uh, the Greeks, or the Romans for that matter, and even uh, the Asians, by and large, they believe in, uh, in, in reincarnation, some form of reincarnation. Only Christians believe that we live our lives just once. All right? So Christianity doesn't do that. Christianity doesn't mean, say, that your life will end with death. And neither would Christianity say you get to relive your life again. You get to rewind. You get a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance again and again. And he says, Christians also do not say this, that human beings aim ultimately to live in material prosperity, a life of sexual comforts and physical pleasure. That's it, isn't it? A materialistic vision of life is, you might as well enjoy life here. This is your heaven. This could be your hell. This could be your heaven. So whatever it is, make the best of it because there's no life beyond this. Now, Thomas Aquinas is actually helping us to see that all these different views actually presents us with something fatalistic, beyond our control. And it doesn't seem to be uh, an end to it. It's either an immediate end, a dead end, or there's no ending. Every ending is a new beginning, a new beginning, a new beginning, a new beginning. And that itself seems to be a crazy form of existence. Christianity proposes that there is a final end. And that final end doesn't come from just merely death, nor does it come from nirvana, entry into some permanently impersonal state. Actually, Christianity speaks of our end as God. Remember the first talk I said, eschaton, which means the end. And I explain, when we use the word eschaton, the end, in the singular, we are referring to God. Man finds his end in God. And what is this end? It is to see God face to face. And this is why it explains human longing for the infinite. How so? Notice that in this life, we desire, we, we work for things, we are drawn to certain things, whether it is to a, to a hobby or is to a person or to a place or to an experience, nothing ever fully satisfies. It may satisfy us for a moment and then it passes and we find ourselves longing again. And the reason why there is this constant perennial longing is because actually deep down inside, we are longing for God, all right? God created a hole in our soul, in our hearts, in our beings. And only God can fill that hole. And we are constantly yearning, thirsting, and hungering for it. Sometimes we can't put our finger in it. We don't understand it. 
just like the Samaritan woman who met Jesus at the well. She was hungering for something, but she could not put a, a finger in it. And Jesus helped her see that she was really hungering for the living water. He was explained to her that he was the living water. God will quench her thirst, her ultimate thirst. Nothing else in this life can quench that thirst. So it is reasonable. How? It can be proven. How? Now it's interesting uh, because desire is seen by the Buddhists as the cause of all suffering. Right? Desire is the cause of suffering, of dukkha. But Christians are saying our desire is the proof that we were made for the infinite. Our desire is proof that there is a God and that we are made for him. See the difference? So what is this seeing God face to face? Saint Teresa of Avila on her deathbed said this, and it's quite beautiful. Lord, it is time to meet. You know, she has been talking to God, perhaps like a pen pal. Eh? So I, I imagine it at, in this way. She had many mystical experiences of God. And mystical experience is a glimpse of heaven, actually. Yeah? And yet she recognized that in this life, she will never be able to see God face to face. And on her deathbed, it was a moment of joy because she would finally meet the person that she has been speaking to from a distance without having actually met the person in person, in front of her, face to face. Okay. Isn't that wonderful? That at death, we finally meet God face to face. Um, the, for the Jews, the ideal for the Jews or the equivalent of the so-called saint, uh, the Christian saint, uh, the Sadiq, the righteous man is precisely this. The goal of a Jew is to be able to see God face to face. No Testament speaks of how Moses desired to, to see God and was granted the privilege, the sole privilege of seeing God. But even he could not see God face to face. He could only see God passing by his, his back. And that was enough already. His face would now shine, would be transfigured, and he had to wear a veil in front of his people so that they would not be horrified and terrified by the glory of God. And then Jesus in, God, in John's gospel tells us, to see me is to see the Father. Now we have a vision of God whom we cannot see. The, the Jews wanted to see the face of God, but they knew that whoever sees the face of God will die. All right? And that was expressing a truth. No one in his life can see God's face. The only way you see God's face is when you're dead. All right? So you will die. But Jesus, we can see God's face in Jesus and we live. We are not dead. And in a way, there is a reason to explain that. That now through Jesus, God gives us the grace to see him face to face without being destroyed, annihilated as a result of beholding God's glory. That's why heaven is described as the beatific. Beatific here refers to beatitudes, which means the, the happy vision. It's like seeing a friend, a long, a friend that you have uh, kind of nurtured a relationship through, e through letters, okay? Now with Facebook and things like that, uh, the, the excitement of a surprise meeting has been taken away from us. But those days before you have Facebook, before you could send pictures, you would be writing letters and you would always be wondering, who is this person on the other side of the world? Writing to me and I'm writing to this person. And finally, when you get to see the person face to face, wow, the joy of it. All right, you're not disappointed, but uh, some people may be disappointed. Now, this is this, that you get to see God face to face and what a joyful experience that would be. Beatific vision. So how is this beatific vision, seeing God face to face? Certainly it's not seeing with our senses through our eyes. This vision is not sensible. 
as if God was seen, were to be seen with our physical eyes. Rather, we speak of it as an intellectual contemplation. That's why the mystics, the saints in this world, some of them were granted ecstatic mystical experiences in prayer, where they were able to see a vision of God. And even that vision of God in this, is indescribable. It leaves them changed forever. Did they see with their physical eyes? Certainly not. What they beheld was an intellectual contemplation of God. But even that is merely a shadow. But heaven, it will no longer be a shadow. It will be a reality that all of us will be able to behold the face of God, contemplate his face intellectually. Because God is infinitely perfect and utterly transcendent with respect to his creation, the natural intellect of man and angel is incapable of seeing God without the help of grace. So it's like this. You will not be able to see God. It's, it's like the Greek myth of looking at Medusa, you know, and you're turned into stone. But in this case, no, we'll be, we'll be destroyed. We cannot see God face to face because of his, his glory, his, his transcendence. You know, it will be too glorious, too beautiful, too wonderful, too truthful for us to behold. And the only way we can do it is God allows us to see him through grace. And how can we describe this vision? Well, it is described in this way. Immediate, but not comprehensive. And that's wonderful. Huh? It's telling us that heaven will be full of surprises. Lots of people think heaven is quite boring. When, huh? You know, everything is beautiful. Huh? After a while, you get bored. Huh? That's why uh, doing naughty things, evil things, teams, seems to be so much more interesting, okay? There's variety in, in wicked things. That's what we imagine. We seldom imagine good as something which is constantly surprising. Well, that's God. We will have an immediate contemplation of his glory and of his beauty, but it will never be comprehensive, which means that there will always be new things to discover, we will never, never get bored in heaven. Hell, on the other hand, is eternal boredom. Hell is eternal boredom, but in heaven, it will always be eternal surprises. This is the scene of the first of Michelangelo in Sistine Chapel on the Eastern Wall. It's the painting of the Last Judgment. You know, Michelangelo took four years to paint this. Then subsequently, due to, to people saying, oh, he's painting pornography and things like that, uh, the Pope instructed someone to paint over and paint loincloths of that. And only in, in just, I think, the last 40 years, where there was the restoration of the artwork in Sistine Chapel, I think this is before the restoration, so it still looks a little bit uh, but some of the things you can see, the loincloths have been removed. But what I'm saying is that if you've ever been to the Sistine Chapel, you know, if it is on a crowded day, you will never get a chance to really admire all the, the beauty and the work there, right? Uh, actually quite an anti-climax one. You know, you hear about it, you read about it, and you're waiting to see it. And you walk in, and then you're given 15 minutes because there's a big crowd queuing out outside, now, maybe if you go and uh, they let you in, I hear that they have opened up certain parts of the Vatican. Well, you won't have a crowd <laughs> because of coronavirus. Okay, so you may get to, to spend long hours there admiring the frescoes. But even that, look at this from this vantage. You want to get a good picture, you have to stand far away. You want to get details, you have to go nearer. But even as you go closer to it, you will be able to see that there are so many other details right high up there. You can spend hours weeks, months, and even years studying just this painting and it will still surprise you. You will still discover things about it that you've never seen before. And that's just one painting, a fresco on a wall, a work of man. How about God? In our intellectual contemplation of him, being able to see him face to face, 
there will be, you know, in life we have so many questions uh, that we want to, to pose to God. We want to know why he's like that, why he did this and what. It will be never ending and God will never tire us. And we will never be tired of God in heaven. He will be full of surprises, surprises after surprises. So don't worry. Heaven will not be boring. Hell, on the other hand, will be eternal boredom. The other thing that we could say about this, what we contemplate, the longer we hold, we look at something is because in a way we say we have fallen in love with it. The more we look at something, the more we examine something, the more we come to know to know it. And the more we know something, we are drawn into a deeper love. You know, heaven and hell has often been described as states of being. And I say that one way of describing a state of being is also a relational state, the state of our relationship with that thing, okay? So, um, you know, Thomas Aquinas, again, in, in, in his, uh, as he was explaining, his first, the, the concept of the proof of God, okay? And he explained about uh, existence and essence, all right? That everything exists has essence, but they are two separate things, okay? You are here, you exist because of something else. Because your essence and your existence are different. Uh, it will take too long to try and explain this and it's going to go all over the place. But he says, when you go back all the way, you will eventually come to an essence which is also existence. It cannot be just going back and back and back and back. There must be a beginning to something like a big bank and everything. There must be a cause to all existence because that essence itself is existence is the foundation of existence. And that is God. So think of it, the state of our being is this, that all our relationships, that human beings, the moment we are born, we are conceived, we are already related. We are related to our parents. And we come up, we define ourselves by relationship. That's why when you describe someone, someone is a father, he's a son, he's a mother, he's a sister, you know, he does his work. Everything that you say about a person actually describes the person in a relational way. We are relationship. Now, as you come into, enter heaven, into the presence of God, you're entering into the very foundation of relationship itself, of love. So if heaven consists in the vision of God's essence, he's the foundation of all essence and all existence. It consists of this the perfect love of God. St. John tells us, God is love. That equation, God is love. We cannot love what we do not know. That's why we have been created to know God. And from knowing God, we come to love him, to serve him, be with him in paradise forever. Knowledge precedes that love. So we cannot love when we do not have knowledge. And we can love most perfectly what we come to know most perfectly. So in the first thing, when we describe heaven as beatific vision, is being able to see God face to face, having this perfect, immediate comprehension of him. And yet not so comprehensive because there are so many surprises that are constantly, eternally revealing itself to us. And because of that, we know him more perfectly, we can love him more perfectly. This love burns the heart. So here in this life, when someone goes into this, you know, into an experience of prayer that unites him or her with God, we call it ecstasy. And it comes actually from a Greek word, two Greek words, ecstasis, to stand outside of oneself. So when you're in ecstasy, you are actually out of your body. It's the out-of-body experience, one may say. You are actually out of this world. So in heaven, the will of the human soul goes out ecstatically into the goodness of God. And the soul rests profoundly in the possession of God, eternally satiated by the love of God, wrapped out of itself. 
that's why we can say love unites, but persons in love remains distinct. So when you say, I love somebody, a husband loves his wife, they become one. And yet you recognize they are still distinct. Likewise, we say the soul can be united with God in heaven, but the soul does not become God. Now that's pantheism. There's pantheism, there's panentheism. Panentheism is that God is within everything in an ontological way. Pantheism, which is all of us are extensions of God. Now, heaven is not all of us merging into this great, this great uh, uh, force called God, all right? It's not like Star Wars. Uh? Star Wars, like all of us are part of the force. And, you know, and when you die, you eventually, you know, I can't remember what is the thing. It's like the cells or whatever it is, enters back into the force. And that's why uh, you are connected with all the Jedis of the past and the Sith Lords of the past because of this connection. No, it's not like that. When you die, your soul, you do not lo lose your distinctiveness. You become united with God and yet remain distinct because that is what love is all about. Finally, the last thing that we want to speak of heaven is in terms of the communion of saints. Lots of people misunderstand and think that the communion of saints refers to all the saints in heaven. Actually, the communion of saints is a way of describing the church. And it's a way of humbling us. You know, very often today, lots of people say, we the church, we are the church. Actually, that's quite uh, arrogant because it's making a claim that is not entirely true. We are part of the church. That's more accurate because the church is made up of those who came before us and also made up of those who will come after us. We do not equal church. People who say we are the church often think that they can guide the church, they can make decisions about the church, that they can shape the church, that the church is all about them. No, we are part of the church. All right. And so when we speak of the communion of saints, we talk about the three, the three stages of that communion of saints. The church militant, which is all of us, the living people, we are called the church militant because we have to struggle and strive with sin, with temptation, with suffering, with death. Then you have the souls in purgatory, we call the church suffering. And then the church triumphant, Mary and the saints in heaven, the angels. What is this communion of saints and how do we use this to explain heaven? Earlier we have been speaking of relationship with God, right? Both being able to contemplate him perfectly, being able to see him face to face, being, it describes a perfect, the, the perfection of our love for him and his love for us, but it's also communal. So when we describe heaven from the perspective of communion of saints, we see that in heaven, we are connected to other people. So if hell entails a cold isolation of oneself withdrawn from God and others, Heaven is the opposite. The souls of those who are united with God are also united with to one another in a common life. One cannot say, I love God and hate my neighbor. All right, St. John who gave us God is love also told us that. You cannot say claim to say that you love God and yet you hate your neighbor. If you love God, you must love your neighbor perfectly. If you say you love God perfectly, then you must love your neighbor perfectly. And that is the reason why we need purification. Purgatory is purification, especially for misguided loves, for hates, envy, unforgiveness. So that in heaven, in heaven, these things no longer exist. In heaven, when we see the glory of others, we give thanks to God for them. We give thanks to God for the qualities and the holiness of all other persons. Notice in this life, we are constantly plagued by rivalries and jealousies. You know, normally we accuse other people of being jealous of us, envious of us, and being our rivals. Seldom do we actually admit that we feel jealous of others. You know, I've been hearing confessions for many years. 
and I'm quite sure there is jealousy because everyone tells me that this person is jealous of me, this person is jealous of me. Even I experience that. I say, I think this person is jealous of me. But you know, in confession, one of the least confessed sins is jealousy. <laughs> no one, hardly anyone will confess that you were jealous. All right, quite interesting. So we are saying here, yeah, later when I talked about the resurrection of the body, we believe that there are di different degrees of holiness and the effects of holiness based on the different degrees of love shown in this life. But in heaven, even if I see someone shining brighter, that's a, that's a, uh, a graphic description. That person is shining brighter. I will not be jealous. I will not be upset with that. The only one that was upset with that was who? The devil, right? He was jealous of God. And he was, and in in Jewish tradition and also in 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 Muslim uh, writings, the devil was jealous of man. Okay, but you will not find it in in our Christian uh, canon. But the devil was jealous. So we will not be jealous of anyone in heaven. In fact, when we see someone shining brighter, we will be filled with joy and to to admire the goodness of that person. Someone described it this way. Our cups in heaven will be of different sizes based on how we live our lives here. The more love you show here, your cup will be bigger there. But nevertheless, all our cups will be overflowing with grace. So the amount of grace that each of us receive will always be more than enough. Don't compare your cup because it will always be overflowing. Your cup will never be half filled. Your cup will never be empty in heaven. So there's no need to compare. We also see in the communion of saints living here and now, the connection between the living and the dead. And that's why we pray for each other. The living pray for the souls in purgatory. The souls in purgatory, according to some theologians, pray for the living, but they cannot pray for themselves. So that's why the living must pray for them. And the saints in heaven, they pray for us, hear the living, and they also pray for the souls in purgatory. Okay. I'm going to just move to this very quickly because it's already reflected in the things that I've said from the catechism. Those who die in God's grace and friendship are perfectly purified, live forever with Christ. They are like God forever. They see him as he, he is face to face. This perfect life with the most holy trinity this communion of life and love with the Trinity, with the Virgin Mary, the angels, and all the blessed is called heaven. Heaven is the ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest longings, a state of supreme, definitive happiness. To live in heaven is to be with Christ. The elect live in Christ, but to retain or rather find their true identity, their own name. So we are united with Christ, and yet we are still distinct. We still have our own identity. By his death and resurrection, Jesus Christ has opened heaven to us. This mystery of blessed communion with God and all who are in Christ is beyond all understanding and description. So, how to describe heaven? Well, the Bible gives us different images. Life, light, peace, a wedding feast, wine of the kingdom, the Father's house, the heavenly Jerusalem, paradise. And yet we must recognize no eye has seen nor Year has heard, nor heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So none of us can claim to know. Because of his transcendence, God cannot be seen as he is unless he himself opens up his grace to man's immediate contemplation and gives him the capacity for it. So we really cannot see God with our natural capacity, with our senses. God must give us the grace for this. And so we see God through contemplation rather than with our physical eyes. That's why it's called a vision, a beatific vision. This beautiful line comes from St. Augustine's City of the God, City of God, describing heaven. There we shall be still and see. We shall see and we shall love. We shall love and we shall praise. So we'll take a five minutes break and we'll come back again for the second half of the session, the last topic, which is the resurrection of the body 
or the resurrection of the flesh. We'll see you in a while. We'll take a five minute break.
Is everyone back? Okay, we will start, okay? All right, that took longer than five minutes. Okay. So we've come to the last part of the last part of the last things, all right? So we're gonna talk about the, the resurrection of the flesh. We're gonna venture into something which is certainly more mysterious than anything else. And yet at the same time, something which we had at least the early Christians, the apostles, the witnesses of resurrection had seen with their own eyes. So on the one hand, it is something which, which many of us uh, it continues to be a mystery in a broad sense of the word. You know, we don't know how the resurrection will look like. And on the other hand, among all those things that we speak of, which we will experience in terms of the last things, this is the one thing which the early Christians had seen. And so if we take their word to be true, and it's not just one person, two persons, one person, two persons, you can corroborate a lie. There were, St. Paul speaks of many witnesses in the hundreds who saw the resurrected Lord. So they saw with their own eyes. They've seen, they've touched, they've heard as St. John tells us. St. Paul had a vision of our Lord, all right? He may not have seen our Lord physically. There's, there's nothing to, 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 to discount the fact that he may have seen Jesus personally while he was living. But the story of St. Paul enters, we, we hear of him only in the Acts of the Apostles after Jesus' ascension. You're not too sure whether he would have seen Jesus, most likely, all right? Jesus was an important figure, a very public figure. So, but after his resurrection, it was not just Jesus revealing himself to a small group of people who could have lied about it, but St. Paul in his argument defending the resurrection of the body begins with first defending the resurrection of Christ, establishing this important truth that Christ did rise from the dead. And so the foundation of our belief in our own resurrection it's hinged on our belief in Christ's resurrection. Lots of people today, thousands, 2,000 years later, will try to refute this, will give all kinds of things and say, you know, where's, you know? Now, what are they relying on? They, do, they are not relying on, eye, on any eyewitness evidence. Christians, on the other hand, we have eyewitness evidence. Unless you're going to say that all those people some of them who may not know each other at all, just all came together, or maybe they didn't even come together. By coincidence, they came to the common conclusion that Jesus rose from the dead and, you know, it was pure speculation. No, there were eyewitnesses. And it is important to, to assert this. There were eyewitnesses. And people today who refute this and who argue that were, there was no such thing, you know, what proof do you have? Do not know what they are talking about. The proof of Jesus' resurrection is not just merely dependent on an empty tomb. Notice the empty tomb is not sufficient. They came up with all kinds of stories about the empty tomb, that someone had stolen the body of Jesus. Even Jesus' own disciples thought that his body was stolen. They never could imagine that he had risen from the dead. Of course, he told them that, but it may have thought that he was again speaking metaphorically. He wasn't speaking about it in a literal sense. But when he rose again and appeared to them, then lo and behold, what he said was true. Here was a man who was dead, dead for three days, and now he is in front of them. So the, our last topic here on the resurrection of the body, though many people may not have seen it in their own lifetime. 
Our faith is a faith dependent on the eyewitness of these early Christians who saw Jesus, the risen one. And because of that, we can say with all certainty that we believe in the resurrection of the flesh. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. Not sure why the flight sometimes does not seem to change. Okay. So St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit who dwells in you. So look at that. Our resurrection is ultimately tied to the resurrection of Christ. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then, then our hope in our resurrection is unfounded. We are just making a speculation. But because Christ was raised from the dead. Therefore, notice the connection. Therefore, we believe that we will also, God, the Spirit will also raise, uh, give life to your mortal bodies. Notice that it's not just to your immortal souls. The resurrection is not just about the, the resurrection of a soul. The soul cannot be, can be resurrected. A body has to be resurrected, okay? Not only our mortal soul will live on after death, but even our mortal body will come to life again. That's what the resurrection is about. So actually, when you say resurrection of the body, uh, it's, it's kind of redundant because the resurrection itself actually points to the body. It's not about the soul. Too often we believe that you know, we exist after death in a spiritual form, our soul, you know, and you see movies, you see this translucent being, you can still see the big, because if he was invisible, you, there will not be a movie, there will not be a story to tell. So you will see this figure that looks like a translucent uh, spirit or soul moving, no one else sees it, you know, only you, the viewer from the television will see it. Okay, we see that, and most of the time you make the conclusion that's the case. Notice that in most of these movies, we never see a resurrection of the body. And the only time we see bodies rising from the dead are in zombie movies. The resurrection is definitely not a zombie. Okay, the resurrected person is not a zombie. Why? Zombies are soulless corpses that have been reanimated. They can move, but they have no soul. The resurrected body is the body with the soul. Stitched back together with its soul. And why is this? Because we talk again about the human person, every individual. What makes a person a person? It is our body and our spiritual soul. A soul without a body is incomplete and a body without a soul is also incomplete. For the body, for the person to be truly living and complete whole in all wholeness, the soul must be stitched back in a way, I use this language, with the body. Without belief in a resurrection of the body, it's difficult to understand belief in the immortality of the soul. Now that's interesting. Because if there is no body, then we are left with certain options. We, if we don't have a body, then our soul has to transmigrate into another body, right? So Hinduism, some forms of Hinduism believes in that, that a body moves from one body, the soul, sorry, migrates from one body into another body. Or we believe the soul is absorbed into a larger impersonal force. That's a form of pantheism. That all of us actually are part of God. And when we die, we eventually merge back into this, into God. We lose our identity. We lose our being. We're just an extension of God. So this is not what Christianity teaches. What's the basis of our belief? The fundamental reason for the church's confes confession in the resurrection of the body is this, and I said, stated this at the beginning. It's the historical resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith will be in vain. 
The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ provides irrefutable evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. You know, in a court of law, uh, you have this writ called the writ of habeas corpus. Show the corpse. Uh, it's usually used in terms of a crime being committed, especially a murder case. So if you say someone is being accused of murder, you must show the corpse. If you can't find a corpse, then how can you pursue the charges against this person? You said you've killed this person, but where's the person? So that's why, you know, in many of these crimes, they try to, to, to get rid of the body, right? So as a way of defense, you can kind of file a writ of habeas corpus. You tell the courts, you tell the prosecutor, show me the corpse, show me the body. Jesus is the divine habeas corpus. God shows us the body, not a dead body, not just a dead corpse, like in a court of law. He shows us a living body, which proves that everything Jesus said, and the thing which seems most incredible in all of Jesus' teachings, Jesus taught many things, right? About morality, about this, about that. But the thing that seems most incredible is that he will be put to death, but on a third day, he will rise again. That's the most incredible thing. Now, one can say, oh, Jesus lied to us here, but he told us the truth here. But if anyone were to doubt that last line, he was put to death, he'll rise again, then maybe it will just demolish all of his other teachings, the foundation of every other teaching. But now, if Jesus was right, if Jesus told the truth that on the third day he will rise again, then everything else he said must be true. So the resurrection was not only the supreme validation, proof of his deity, it also validated the scriptures who foretold his coming and resurrection. So if Christ's body was not resurrected, we have no hope that ours will be. In fact, apart from Christ's bodily resurrection, we have no saviour, no salvation, no hope of eternal life. If Jesus was merely a teacher, he taught us nice teaching, then he died. Then okay, we live good lives. Okay, we live good lives, we, we are good people. But that's all. Can we be saved on by ourselves? No, we can't be saved. We need a savior. And that savior had to undergo death and resurrection because he had to defeat death. And the only way he was going to defeat death was not by remote control. Huh? He would have to enter death and, and rest that power from death itself. If death can no longer have a hold on any person who died, that is Jesus Christ, now death can no longer have a hold on us. The system has been broken. So the catechism explains how we will rise, eh? okay? So what is this rising? In death, again, is the separation of the soul from the body the human body decays, the soul goes to meet God, and we wait. We wait for the soul's reunion with his glorified body. God in his mighty power will definitively grant incorruptible life to our bodies by reuniting them with our souls through the power of Jesus' resurrection. So, who will rise, you may say? Who will be given these bodies again? All the dead will rise, the just as well as the unjust. Even the, the souls in, in hell will be given bodies. The souls in purgatory will be given bodies. The saints in heaven will be given bodies. How? All of them will rise again with their own bodies, their own bodies, which they now bear. So yesterday we had a discussion about how our, our resurrected body would look like. But now they will be changed. Our lowly body will become like glorious body. It will be a spiritual body. Okay? So this body that ages, this thing, we'll look at the properties of, of the resurrected body. 
that comes from to us from scripture. Okay, be patient. So how is this? This how? Now you will be saying how ah how ah, and I'm quite sure some of you are already keying in your your questions in the chat group. How ah how ah, you know, as if like like we now I can give you a perfect answer. The thing is, as I said, it is revealed to us, but it is beyond our imagination. So CCC paragraph one thousand says this how. How is it going to happen? Exceeds our imagination and understanding. So I hope you're not going to type that question. How are? Uh, it exceeds our imagination and understanding. It is accessible only to faith. And if you want to know how it happens, there is an analogy to it. It's the Eucharist. The Eucharist already gives us a foretaste of Christ's transfiguration of our bodies. How so? We speak of the Eucharist as truly, really, substantially, substantially the body and blood of Christ, his humanity, and his divinity. Now, that's a lot of words, a lot of description, very theological. And yet, when we look at the Eucharist, what do we see? We still see bread, even after the priest has consecrated the host. We still see bread. When we consume it, we still taste that bread. It still looks like bread, still feels like bread, still smells like the same bread. But our faith tells us it is no longer bread. It is the body and blood of Christ, truly, really, substantially. His humanity, his divinity. If we can use that language to describe the Eucharist, that's how we would describe the resurrection, okay? All right? It is beyond our limited understanding. But our faith tells us this is true. When will this happen? When will the resurrection take place? Well, I've been saying this again and again. It will take place at the end of the world. Christ's second coming, the parousia. So, finally, what's the nature of our resurrected bodies? Okay, again, we are moving into this area of mystery, okay? The physical resurrection is a mystery which is only partially revealed. How is it partially revealed? We only see it in terms of the description that is given to us in Scripture. We see it in the description of Christ's own glorified body. Our glorified bodies will be conformed to the model of Christ's glorified body, no longer subject to death or suffering to time or space. The bodies will remain truly material. You know, Jesus wasn't a ghost. That's why in both Luke's gospel as well as in John's gospel, Jesus invites his disciples to touch him. Why? To show that he is real. He's physical. He's not a ghost. St. Thomas Aquinas speaks of the four properties of this resurrected body. And it actually comes from two passages. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44. I'm going to read that out for you. Okay. So in trying to describe the resurrected body, St. Paul begins to use analogies. He says, you know, just as you can describe different types of bodies. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The heavenly have a made splendor of their own, the earthly different splendor, okay? Doesn't answer our question, but just to say that when we are talking about the resurrected body, in a way, there are similarities, but there are vast differences too. The sun has its own splendor, the moon another splendor, the stars yet another splendor, the stars differ among themselves in splendor, okay? There are differences, and likewise, there'll be differences in terms of our lives. Remember earlier, these properties, the qualities of these properties would differ from one individual to the other based on the life of charity we've lived here. So if a person here lives with greater charity, with greater love, with greater sacrifice for others, he will experience these properties perhaps in a more splendorous, more glorious manner. Okay? So, Paul is using the description of all the heavenly bodies to describe this. 
the sun, the moon, they all are splendorous, but of a different degree, different levels. Then we come to verse 42. This is where we get the four properties. It is the same too with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. This is the property of impassibility, I will explain. What is sown is contemptible, but what is raised is glorious. What is sown is a natural body, and what is raised is a spiritual body. And then we have Matthew 13, verse 43. Let me read that so that I will not give you a wrong quotation. 13.43. This is chapter 13, if you remember, in the Gospel of St. Matthew. It's the apocalyptic text. It's about the end times, about Jesus' second coming. So it talks about judgment, about those who will be thrown into hell, <laughs> blazing furnace, where there'll be weeping and grinding of teeth. And then in verse 42, he speaks of those in heaven, the righteous. It says this, Then the upright will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. All right? So from these two texts, we will say, say Thomas Aquinas derives these four properties. The first one is impassibility. It's the freedom from bodily corruption. This body will no longer suffer. It will no longer age. It will no longer experience any sickness. It will not die. Okay? That's impassibility. Saltity. Saltity. It will be a spiritual body, spiritual refinement or matter. So even though it is material, it is physical, but it's not confined to the limitations of our bodies now. Like for example... Try walking through the wall, all right? Unless you are Superman, you can maybe walk through the wall, break the wall. And even Superman has to break through the wall, okay? Subtlety here would be, be the ability to even move through matter. Things which restrict our bodies now will no longer be a limitation or restriction. That's why Jesus was able to enter into the upper room in the Gospel of St. John chapter 20 when the apostles were gathered there. Thomas was not there, remember the story? of Thomas not being there, Jesus entered into a room even though they were hiding behind closed doors. Stultity. Then we have agility. Agility, often we think of terms of quickness. Here, the body who is limited in terms of its strength, of its capacities, of its abilities, of its talents, you know, some of us are more talented in this area. Some of us has greater strength in that area. Then all these limitations will be removed. So agility is seen in the ability to be able to be in different places at different times. And that you will have not just merely superhuman strength. Your strength will be one in which will defy the limitations of your present body. And finally, clarity. We will shine like the sun in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of the Father. Matthew 13, 43. We'll be bright. And Paul also uses, describes this in uh, 40 and 41, uh, chapter 15, verses 40 and 41. He talks about, you know, that just think of it in terms of the different heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars. Their brightness differs one from the other. And so, likewise, uh, when, we go, when we get to heaven, I guess, um, I mean, this is just using this language to describe something which remains a mystery. Uh, when we get there, then we really know how we all look like, right? But the fact of the matter is that what is clear is that not, it is not equal. It is not equal in the, and that inequality is not something which is negative. It is just a reflection of justice. And justice means that in this life, if we had given more, 
And just like God makes this promise to Jesus, the more you give, the more you'll be given. The measure that you measure out will be the same measure that you receive. Likewise, in terms of our bodies in heaven, this resurrected body, it will reflect the way we had lived our lives here. If we had lived our lives with greater faith, greater charity, greater hope, then it will be reflected in our bodies. And Paul uses this image of shining, different shining heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars. They all have their own uh, brilliance, okay? Uh, but you see, the resurrected body is a body that now where the disharmony, the defects of sin has all been removed, we have returned to not just the original harmony intended by God, but to a more perfected harmony. That's why we are called the new creation. But then, it is not just us who will be transformed in this way. The physical universe will also be reformed. And so this vision, this picture given by the book of Revelation is, there will be a new earth and a new heaven. It is not only the harmony within ourselves and among ourselves as human beings that will be transformed, changed, transfigured. The whole universe will also be transfigured. You see how it works. Sin caused disharmony to us. And because we are the crown of creation, since sin has caused disharmony to us, we have caused disharmony to whole of creation. But now if that disharmony has been healed, removed, and now we are perfected beings, the whole of creation too follows suit. All right? The whole of creation will be remade, reformed. That every single thing which exists will now return to its original purpose, the, the reason for its existence, which is the worship of God. What a beautiful and amazing image. So I hope that this entire talk has actually led us to see that the last things, rather than something which frightens us, and if it frightens us, it's because it instills within us a holy fear of God, a motivation to reform our lives, to repent, and to turn to God. But it also should be a motivation for us positively to live a holy life. If we want to be saints, we should start living as saints today. Recognizing that if we want to live in the brilliance of that resurrected body, we begin to live our lives brilliantly here and now. So I'll close with this blessing that comes from St. Paul at the close of his letter to the Thessalonians. May the God who gives us peace make you completely his and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from all fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May this be our prayer and may this also be our prayer for others, for each one who is making this journey together to the end, to the lasting who is God himself. All right, so we'll come to the end of the talk. Uh, maybe we'll say the prayer first, and then uh, we have some questions. Eh? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. John, are you there? Yes. There's uh, six questions. Oh. Okay. <laughs> First question. The soul is united with God, but does not become God. But can we say we are part of God, therefore having God's consciousness in us? Mm hmm Can we say that we are part of God? Now, that would be the, the heresy of uh, pantheism. Huh? Okay, 
Remember earlier I mentioned panentheism and pentheism. Panentheism, P-A-N-E-N-T-H-E-I-S-M. It believes that God is in all. Yeah, God is God and we are we. But uh, yet in a certain way still, there is a blur, blurring of that identity. Pentheism, on the other hand, is everything is God and God is everything, all right? So we must be careful when we say this, you know, that our union with God does not remove our distinctiveness, all right? That's why we say we can become like God. The whole process of sanctification, of going to hell, heaven is we become like God. We do not become God, right? The temptation of Adam and Eve by the devil was simply this. You will become gods, right? It is wishing to be gods. So, yeah. So that distinction needs to be maintained between God and his creatures. We as creatures. But ultimately, as creatures, we have to be united with him in this loving relationship while remaining distinct. Think of it in terms of the Trinity also. Now, the Trinity... One God, three persons. They are distinct persons, yet they are so perfectly united in one being. Now, as human beings, as all of creation, that union with him is different from the union of the three persons of the Trinity. Because the three persons of the Trinity, is their unity is so perfect, there is only one being, which is God. We are a separate being from God. We are our being, our existence depends on God, all right? So though we return to heaven and we say we are united to him, we do not become him. We do not merge into him. We are still distinct from him, okay? Okay, second question. It was mentioned in CCC that through the death and resurrection of Christ, he opened heaven for us. Does it mean that before Christ came and died for us, everyone else is not able to go to heaven yet? Yeah. Uh, without Christ dying for us, heaven will not be open to any one of us. Now, remember, in the last few talks, I talked about time and space. Human beings, we exist in time and space. Everything in creation exists in time and space. There is nothing that exists outside of time and space except God. Only God exists outside of time and space. So whatever God does, God is not confined to time and space. So here we have the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus takes place within our time and space. Right? His historical event took place 2,000 years ago. But remember, Jesus is not just Jesus, not just the human Jesus. Jesus is also God. And because, whatever, and because he's God, whatever action that he does has this implication that goes beyond time and space. So one may say that in this, in this earth, from the moment this universe was created until now, it may have been billion and billions, trillions of years. No one knows how long this, this universe has existed. But we Christians will say it did not it has not existed in uh, infinitely, all right? There was a time when this universe did not exist. But we cannot say that of God. So let's look at it this way. For as far as God is concerned, these trillion years for him is a single moment. So whatever he does, whatever he does has an impact within our existence that that uh, points to the past as well as to the future. Now, we may see it's the past. that Oh, before Christ came, then all those people were waiting. Yeah, we use that kind of language to describe this, that they were waiting, waiting for, for Jesus to come to save them. Yeah, in our existence. That's the only way we can conceive it. But as far as God is concerned, everything happens in, in that twinkling of an eye. All right. So yes, in one sense, we can say no one could get to heaven uh, 
except with 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 Christ's death. All right. Now, how does that count for people like John the Baptist or Saint Joseph? Remember again, they. If Joseph died before the death of Jesus, John the Baptist died before the death of Jesus. There were other maybe righteous patriarchs. How? Did they have to wait a little longer for, for Jesus to die? Well, if you calculate it based on our human understanding of time and space, it would seem to be the case. But remember, as God, that single event that took place 2,000 years ago already took place in, in the dimension of God, in the realm of God, beyond time. Yeah. Can you understand that? If you can't understand that, it's all right because it's another mystery. All right. So, okay. Okay. Next question: <clears throat> Is there a possibility that God is lonely, so He made us to know Him, to love Him, and to serve Him, and to be with Him forever in heaven? Yeah. God is never lonely because God does not need anything. God is perfect. You see, a perfected, a perfect being has no need of anything. He has all that he needs. We need something. We are in need of something because we're not perfect. So the need for something, the yearning for something, the desire for something is a reflection of our imperfection. So God created us not out of a need. God created us out of love. Today, when we talk about love, very often the love that we speak of is a love that springs from a need. That's why Christians are still ultimately called to transcend their selfish needs, to love as God loves, you know, agape love, caritas, a selfless love, loving beyond our own personal needs. So if, if we are capable of doing this with the grace of God, all right, we can only do it with the grace of God. Without God's grace, we are not. We are incapable of this kind of love. All right, that's a reflection already of God Himself, a God who is selfless and uh, unselfish, <laughs> because He has no particular. He doesn't have any need. Yeah, because He's already perfect. But a God who is love itself, unconditional love itself. So. The reason why it's difficult to think of that, and we often people will say, oh, God created us because <laughs> he's, he needs us and things like that, is because that more than anything else reflects our own selfishness, okay? Because we cannot picture how you could do something like that. Because everything that we do very often is self, is, is, is in a way, is self-centered, right? Most of the time it's self-centered. Even when we say we want to do something out of love, very often because we want people to love us. That's why we love them. Right, the, our whole lives would be learning how to love selflessly. That's why there's purgatory. The reality of purgatory is that most of the time, even when we attempt to love, we love imperfectly. Now, God's love is perfect. Because God's love is perfect, He has no need. He has no need for us to love Him in return. He created us out of love made us in his image, which means that we are capable of being like him. Like him. And how can we be most like him? By also loving selflessly like him. Okay, next question. St. Paul had mentioned a man was caught up to the third heaven. So the question is, how many levels of heaven in Christianity? Uh, this is not defined definitively, uh, but <laughs> uh, I, I can't give you an answer directly. Okay, uh, It could be that in apocryphal writings, one that speaks of different levels of heaven, one also speaks of different levels of hell. Okay, But it is not something which is defined definitively by the church, all right? Okay, next. If body is resurrected with the soul, what happens to the mind? <laughs> the mind, the intellect is part of the soul. 
<laughs> okay, next. Is the mortal body the same physical body when the disease was alive? Uh, I think I've answered that, isn't it? Huh? So I would suggest to the person who asked that question to rewatch the video again. I think the, it was almost the, the, the last slide or the second last slide. All right. So it is, said that we are, it is said that we are given our bodies, you know, but it will be a body that is transformed, a glorified body, a spiritual body. But you want a bit more explanation in it? Just go back again, all right? Okay, last question. Christians talk about near-death experience. What is Catholic's view about it? What is Catholic view on these things? Uh, whatever we say today, I mean, in terms of whether it's a private revelation, I, this all falls under the category of what we call a private revelation, right? It could be a vision that you experience. Uh, there are different levels of, of different types of private revelation. Uh, a, a vision, which is basically um, a picture that you see in your mind. It could be a material, an apparition, a physical apparition. The thing actually appears physically. By the way, like Mary, yeah? we say Mary is an example of a resurrected body. Yeah? That's why uh, she can appear and things like that. And she, you know, and yet she can disappear. She can come down from heaven. She's as bright as the sun. So there can be a physical apparition. There can be a locution, which means that you hear a, a, a sound, all right? So sometimes you see a picture, you hear a sound. Sometimes you see something which seems physical. So that can happen anytime, even at, for people who, who are on the threshold of death. So how can you say it's a near-death experience? Well, uh, Chris, the church has no definition of a near-death experience, all right? Remember, just because you stop breathing or your, or your brain activity flat lines or something else, your heart flat lines, doesn't necessarily mean you're dead theologically. Huh? Theological death is a separation of the soul from the body, the rupture from the body. Yeah. So I would say that so people who would describe these things may fall under the category of private revelation. So what is the place of private revelation? Firstly, we should exercise caution when we hear these things because they are just like anecdotal stories, all right? Um, there's this big uh, discussion going on in America between the media and pr Trump on this drug called uh, hydroxychloroquine, all right? I think you've heard of that, that, that name. It's a drug given to people with lupus and with malaria and things like that. Uh, Trump seems to believe in it and he has stories from doctors. The media is saying that he's putting people at danger because all this is just anecdotal stories, no proof. It is not tested. You, you can have no evidence of it, all right? So in a way, we should also exercise caution when we hear these things. Someone says, oh, I had a vision of this. Oh, I heard this, I heard that, all right? If you believe in every single thing that someone says, then I think you are gullible. And gullibility is also a sin. It is, it is, is, is a sin against faith because gullibility is actually superstition. So it's a sin against faith. All right. On the other hand, you have your skeptics, cynical skeptics who not believe anything at all. Right. That's also another sin against faith. So one must, must, must be able to, to balance in a way that we do not veer too much to gullibility, just believe every single thing without checking it, without proving it, without testing it. And then on the other hand, disbelieving everything. So when it comes to the area of private revelations, the church is always very cautious. It doesn't take your word at face value. It always will test. Now you have people who are believers will come and accuse you. Oh, why is the church so slow in believing? You know, the church, you should believe already. You know, it's so evident. No, is it really evident? If today I say that I had a vision of Jesus and Jesus tells me that 
that you are the Antichrist? Would you believe me if I say that? Obviously, you won't, isn't it? Because you won't believe that you are the Antichrist. So, but if it was something else that squares with already your, your preconceived ideas, you will suddenly say, I believe in this. So I would say that when people share about their near-death experience, it falls under this category of private revelation. Now, if private revelation is, is tested, is proven, the only thing that the church will say is this, that there's nothing, it's, it's a negative judgment. There is nothing there which contradicts what is revealed publicly. What is public revelation? Whatever is in our deposit of faith. Sacred scripture, sacred tradition. All that is necessary for our salvation has already been revealed completely by Jesus. There is no need for additional revelation after sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which is complete in the person of Jesus Christ, handed down to the apostles. It's complete. Now to say that there is a need for other revelations. You have to add stories to it. You're, what are you saying? You're saying that Jesus' revelation was incomplete. All right? Even the Muslims believe something similar. They will say Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. It, in a way, it is saying that he brings into fullness, into perfection, the revelation of God. It's a way of kind of sealing himself off to say, after me, everyone who claims to be a prophet is a liar. All right? So for us Christians, revelation ended with the person of Jesus Christ. And that revelation comes down to us in sacred scripture, sacred tradition. Now, the church also recognizes that certain people may experience private revelations and have, after having tested it, fulfills the criteria for it, may allow some form of devotion to it. But they will only do this if there is no contradiction between that private revelation and public revelation. And if that private revelation does not dis distract us from the essentials of our faith, for example, a private revelation that you must say the certain prayer, and you must say this prayer on Sunday. You don't need to go to church. You don't have to go for mass because you just need to say this prayer and then you'll be guaranteed this is private revelation. This will definitely not be recognized by the church because it's a contradiction as well as distracting us from what is essential to the Christian faith, to the Catholic faith. So when people share about near-death experiences, uh, does it add to the revelation? It may be sometimes, you know, for many people, they find, okay, someone describes hell and describes heaven. Um, you know, it may be a motivation. Oh, this is heaven. Okay. Hell. Okay. This is, uh, you know, I don't want to go to hell. Oh, terrible. All right. But we need to be very careful that by believing in these things, are they changing? Are they different from revealed doctrine found in scripture and in tradition? If it is contradicting that doctrine, then you should definitely not listen to these things and stay far, far away from them because it could be the work of the devil. All right? So don't get captivated with these things. I know uh, there are stories, personal testimonies, books written, and even videos, YouTube videos. I know lots of our Catholics share them because I see it on Facebook all the time. People sharing these kind of things. All right? Uh, you risk sharing a heresy and you risk actually leading others into error and worse still to hell. So I would ask you to refrain from doing these things. Okay? That's all? Uh, two more new questions. Oh dear. Okay, this question last is questions. Uh, uh, last, because it's the last thing, so last questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because they'll be not Father, ending. <laughs> Father Mikel Rodrigue in Quebec prophesied about end times in Knock Island. What is the Vatican's view on this? I don't know. I'm not familiar with the person. <laughs> Simple answer. <laughs> As I said, all these are private revelations. If you have not heard my last answer, you can watch this video again and listen to it. All right? 
I can make a claim. I, I, I had, a, I mean, I've heard so many people tell me many things. All right. One lady came to me one day and she had a private revelation. She said, the world is coming to an end. You have to allow me to stay in the church 24 hours. If I don't stay in the church 24 hours praying the rosary, the world will come to an end tomorrow. So I told her, you cannot stay in the church. We locked the gates at 10 o'clock. You cannot stay in church. She had a meltdown. Okay, She says, oh, the world is going to come to an end. Then I told her, I assure you, I assure you, the world may not come to an end. It may come to an end. If we die, you die or die, maybe it come to come to an end. You don't worry. All right, you pray the rosary at home. A few days later, I saw her and she came up. This is, I told you, the world didn't come to an end, isn't it? Now, lots of people say lots of things. Lots of people will say, I've had this experience. God spoke to me in this way and that way. All these things need to be tested. Yeah? Simple as that. Do not fall into the sin of gullibility. I'm going to get an angry emoji for all these answers. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, this last question. Christ descended into hell after his crucifixion before his resurrection. Why mm. did he have to free those who died in hell? Yeah, again, I can't hear you, John. Okay. Uh, Christ descended into hell after his crucifixion, before his resurrection. Why did he have to free those who died in hell? Why? That's his job. <laughs> That's his mission. He came to save us. He saves not only the living, but also the dead, all right? So it's quite unfair if he came only to save all those living during his time and after his time. Quite unfair, isn't it? It's like saying, you know, you just save us. Why do you need to save all these people? So all those who died before his coming, surely he would, he would save them, all right? His mission was to save them. Now, we, we talk about hell here. When we use the word hell, it is to describe uh, Sheol, uh, the Hebrew concept of Sheol, the land of the dead. So the, the understanding is that the land of the dead, both the just and the unjust went to the land of the dead, the land of the shadows, right? And so when, he, when we say that Christ descended to hell to save the souls, he saved the souls of the just, of the righteous, all right? For those who are wicked, the evil people who died in, in mortal sin will be eternally separated from God. They, they, you know, Christ will not be able to save them because at the moment of their death, they, there was already that eternal separation. There's no changing of the sentence, all right? But for those who are righteous and just, they were not able to go to heaven without Christ's death. Just like us, we are not able to go to heaven without Christ. It is only because of Christ that we can go to heaven. So likewise, we can say the same about the dead. As a priest friend of mine used to say, uh, come all the way for what? All right? He makes this journey down there for what? For no reason. <laughs> he makes this journey to earth for this reason, to save us. That's why we call him the savior, all right? So he's not just to save the living and those who are going to live after him. He's going to save also those who have died. All right. Is that all? Okay. Yes, yes. Praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> so I'll give you a final blessing and then we can be off. Okay. Let me just escape this. Okay. The Lord be with you. Be with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you press so the much. angry Thank emoji you, now. Thank you, Father. Good night. Bye. You can press Thank the Father, angry good emoji. Night. Bye. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.